Ah, here it is, picture and all. They've certainly done you proud. Listen to this. Apart from five years at Wallascott, Mr. Pemberton was associated with Winnington for the whole of his career, and his great personality will be missed on the works. <laughs> I never knew he was so popular, Uncle Ted. Oh, I don't know about that. After all, one makes quite a few friends when you've stayed with the firm as long as I have. Yes, I suppose one does. Forty-five years' service. Struth. I can't see myself lasting as long as that. Oh, I see they got you down among the arrivals. It's nice to feel as the third generation of Pemberton's carrying on the old family connection. <laughs> <laughs> How are you liking it? Oh, it's all right, really. But I still feel very much the new boy. Aren't you glad in some ways to be out of it all? No, I'm going to miss life in the works a lot. Already do, in fact. Why, well, I've practiced seeing this division grow up. When I followed my father's footsteps and first joined Winnington, it was Brunner, Mond and company. Yes, there was no ICI then, my boy. You know, your grandfather saw the very beginnings of the alkali industry in this country, and I've seen something of its colossal growth during the past 40 years or so. How did it all start? The industry, I mean. Who invented the process? Ah, now you're getting me on my pet topic. As a matter of fact, I'm writing an article for the magazine on that very subject. What, a history of Brother Mond? Yes, sort of. It's really quite an interesting story. Up to 200 years ago, the only sources of alkali were natural deposits, wood ash, burnt seaweed, and so on. But towards the end of the 18th century, glassmaking and other industries were expanding so rapidly that a new source of alkali had to be found. In the year 1775, the French Academy of Sciences offered a prize for the production of synthetic alkali, the ultimate goal of over a hundred years of experiments by scientists all over the world. The prize was won by Nicolas Leblanc, physician to the Duke of Orleans. In the Leblanc process, salt, sulfuric acid, coal and limestone were made to react in various stages to produce an impure soda ash. Leblanc built a little works at St. Denis, and demand for his product was growing when in 1789 the storm broke. The French Revolution spread like wildfire and reached far into the countryside. The process made little headway for 40 years, until over here, the Industrial Revolution built up a demand for cheaper alkalis and the production of Leblanc alkali grew apace along the banks of the Tyne and by the Mersey over at Widnes. But the Leblanc process was making the countryside hideous with ever-mounting dumps of alkali waste and valuable sulphur trapped in the waste only served to poison the atmosphere with stinking acid fumes. A hundred years ago, a young German chemist worked away in the hopes of finding a way to recover this sulphur from alkali waste. His name was Ludwig Mond. Working in the evenings at his uncle's house at Cologne, young Mond was helped by his cousin, Frieda Lowenthal. Frieda was only 14. But Ludwig already loved her deeply and was later to marry his early love. Having perfected his sulphur recovery process and worked it in Holland, Mond came to try his luck in England. And in 1862 introduced his invention to Hutchinson, a leading manufacturer of alkali at Widnes in Lancashire. Hutchinson was at first sceptical, but finally Mon's persuasiveness won him over. Within ten years, the sulphur recovery process had been adopted by many influential manufacturers. And to its inventor, the process had brought some position and reputation in the chemical world. However, Mon's success was too limited to satisfy him. His inventive mind was always reaching out into the future. Many an evening, after entertaining his friends, one would stay behind. This was John Brunner, Ludwig's great friend and colleague at Hutchinson's. And amid the haze in Ludwig's little parlor, plan after plan was born, talked over and puffed away in cigar smoke.
During the years that John Brunner had looked after the business side of things at Hutchinson's works, he had gained a wide commercial experience and great reputation for probity. His views were practical. He was able to give substance to Mon's almost visionary ideas. Together, they were an ideal business combination. Both men felt cramped by the walls of Hutchinson's works and the town of Widnes. They were tired of being at another's beck and call. Each wanted to be his own boss and answerable only to himself. But neither of them could think of a really satisfactory way of starting up on their own, a way that would give them reasonable profits from the very small capital that they could command. Then, in the early 1870s, their chance came. A letter from a correspondent of Mons brought news of a factory in Belgium where Ernest Solvay was making alkali by the ammonia soda process. The theory of this method had been known for some time, but those who had tried to work it commercially had been defeated at one stage or another. Undaunted by past failures, Solvay had persisted and had achieved a moderate success when Mond came to see him. In Solvay, Mond found a man after his own heart. In the few days that he spent inspecting the works at Quille, Mond saw that some research was still required to perfect the plant. But the advantages of the ammonia soda process over the Leblanc method were only too obvious. No obnoxious waste, and the soda ash produced was without doubt of much finer quality. Convinced of the superiority of the ammonia soda process, Mond came to terms with the Belgian chemist. In return for favorable royalties, he obtained a license from Solvay to work the process in England. And so, John Brunner and Ludwig Mond found their long-awaited chance. Now they could launch out on their own, joining in partnership to work Solvay's ammonia soda process, thus laying the foundations of a great industrial enterprise. And so, with characteristic enthusiasm, all their available capital was pooled, plans drawn up and plant ordered, almost before the ink on the agreement was dry. I well remember your grandfather telling how Mond and Brunner explored the Cheshire salt fields, looking for a site on which to build their factory. Eventually, their search brought them to Winnington Park, one of Lord Stanley of Alderley's estates lying in the Weaver Valley. This was, in Ludwig's words, the site for their works. The River Weaver was navigable and nearby was the railway, a branch of the Cheshire lines that served the heart of industrial England. The brine they needed was to hand and other raw materials were not far off. There was also a considerable colony of salt works in the neighborhood, each built on strips of land purchased from Lord Stanley. Some of these works were even clustered in the bend of the river below Anderton, right in the park. After preliminary inquiries, an appointment was made to meet Lord Stanley's solicitor at the long deserted Winnington Hall. You can guess how they felt as they drove up the long avenue from the lodge gate. My father often heard Ludwig say that the gloom of the place grew thick upon him as they clattered up to the hall. The gilded splendor and gaiety of this fine Regency mansion had long ago faded and tarnished before the steady advance of the squalid ranks of the salt works. But the partners were soon to come up against the first of many difficulties. Their reception at the hall was far from encouraging. There was no argument with his lordship's solicitor. Lord Stanley, he said, was dead against selling any more land piecemeal. If they wanted a site there, they'd have to buy the whole 130 acres, with Winnington Hall thrown in for good measure. Your grandfather, Amos Pemberton, was a local man. His family were blacksmiths and wheelwrights at Broken Cross. But trade was bad, and he was glad to sign on with the partners as an engine fitter. He had no difficulty with Brunner. Ludwig Mond he admired and respected. Fierce, excitable, and strong was Ludwig, brooking no delay nor interference, but kind, deeply kind at heart. 
The work of building the factory was soon underway. Between the two of them, the partners had the energy of ten men. Ludwig wasn't one to suffer fools gladly. And under his and Brunner's direction, the works began to grow, in spite of local grumbling. The partners pressed on with their building. And towards the end of the year, 1873 that was, they started on their first run. That ended soon enough. When they put pressure on the boiler, the feed pump first. Next, the blowing engine started to play them up. But that was only the beginning. As John Brunner put it, everything that could break down did break down, and everything that could burst did. If the men worked hard, the partners worked harder. At night, there was always one of them on duty. Both the partners and their families had moved into Winnington Hall so as to be on the spot. The Mons took the Wyatt wing, and the Brunners the Tudor side of the house. And many a time, Brunner would work at his books until far into the night. It was just as well that they were near the works, for in those days, as indeed you'll find sometimes now, trouble came suddenly and unexpectedly. There was a bell under Ludwig's bedroom window, and many a time a man from the night shift came running to tell him that something was up. Couldn't have been much fun for poor Mrs. Mond in those early days. If it were an accident, she'd go down with Ludwig to give first aid. But fortunately, accidents were few. Time and again, it was a mechanical breakdown that sent Ludwig scurrying off into the night. something didn't go wrong. It was a common enough sight to see old Adam Clark go chasing off the Northwich Post Office with a telegram for engine replacement. Telephones, of course, didn't reach Cheshire until the late 80s. And when the spare parts did come in, that is, if they weren't lost on the railway or something, they'd have a rare struggle to make them fit. Old Betty, as the blowing engine was politely referred to, was always giving them trouble. As the months went by, they practically replaced every working part. But while they were doing this, not a penny piece was coming in, for precious little ash was going out. But the raw materials kept arriving all the time. There were barge loads of ammonia unloaded in the fields by chemic hole. No wharf in those days. There were wagon loads of limestone arriving on the railway. And all these had to be paid for, not to mention, of course, the men's wages. The partners managed to make a few hundred pounds by cutting down timber in Winnington Park and selling it locally. But it didn't bring in enough to make ends meet. In the first year's working, they lost over 4,000 pounds. With this state of affairs, things looked black. Lesser men would have given up, but not the partners. Their minds were made up. It was sink or swim with them. If they sank, they'd never float again. So they decided to swim, come what would. They started a crusade. They canvassed high and they canvassed low for funds, 
trying to get people to take shares in the business or at least to accept shares in payment of their bills. But all their efforts to raise money met with the same reply. People just weren't interested. local tradespeople helped, but the most frequent results of their visits was a firm rebuff, sometimes polite, and other times not quite so polite. The future indeed began to look pretty hopeless. When things were at their blackest, they suddenly struck lucky. Mon's persuasiveness and enthusiasm, together with Brunner's practical arguments, at last won through. They found a backer who was prepared to risk his money. defeat which had hung so heavily over them during those dark days was all at once removed by the timely offer of a substantial check. Overjoyed, Mon sent off a telegram to Ernest Solve, tout va bien, all goes well. And within a month or so, the works were once again in full production turning out soda ash, the like of which, in Ludwig's words, had never been seen anywhere else in the world. In 1876, their soda ash received a special award in America. And in 1881, the formation of a limited company assured their capital and set the seal on their success. Once the ammonia soda process began, in Mon's hands to show promise, a number of rival plants sprang up. But the process wasn't as easy as it appeared on paper, and one after another the rival works failed. Brunner, Mond and company took them over, and soon had works at Sandbach, Port Clarence, Middlewich and Lostock. Mond quickly got them into economic production. Then Ludwig turned his attention to other industrial processes, such as the Mond nickel process. For his valuable contributions to industry, Mond was made a fellow of the Royal Society. And as he had always hoped, he was honoured by his old university at Heidelberg with the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Also at Manchester. And finally at Oxford with a Doctor of Law. Mond's triumphs were, for the most part, in the chemical world and in the works. Brunner made his mark in politics and on the countryside. Brunner became the first MP for Northwich and was later raised to the baronetage. The Right Honourable Sir John Brunner, baronet. And your grandfather was getting grand too. He'd been made transport manager at Winnington. My work. On the firm's 25th birthday, they decided to celebrate. The staff marked the occasion by giving a banquet to the partners at Winnington Hall. And a really splash affair it was. Wines from the director's cellar, and all the best to eat, and a grand concert to follow. Gentlemen, I give you a toast. Our guests are John Brunner and Dr. Ludwig Mond.
the story of how it all started and who started it. The urge to expand and to keep ahead of our markets still drives us on. But even with this continual growth, the standards which the partners set by their industry and learning are maintained. Amid the bustle of the works, the calm, academic atmosphere of the research lab carries on the tradition of Ludwig Mond's first little laboratory up in the attics of Cologne. The spirit of Ludwig Mond still lives in the works. John Brunner's in the towns and countryside. It's quite true to say that the inspiration of these two great men, who started it all, endures to the present day. Well, Tom, one day I hope that you'll be as proud of the old place as I am. 